So I wanted to introduce you guys to Sunny Brown, dear friend and collaborator with Duarte. And she's also the spokesmodel for Sharpie Pens on uncapped.com. <laughs> and she's a starting a doodle, doodle revolution. That's right. And um, basically, she's a business owner and information designer and author of one, Ameri one of America's top 100 business books titled Game Storming. And I do Ooh. love this book. I ordered five more. I've given away all of our copies. But it basically walks you through all kinds of different methodologies for facilitating and leading a brainstorm. It's fantastic. It's just got tons and tons. It's like a playbook. I'm going to give say. one away today. She's going to give one away today. To one and of you lucky people. It was uh, co-written. <laughs> she co-wrote it with uh, David Gray, who's the chairman of X Plane up in Portland. Mm. And she's best known for her large-scale graphic recording and live content visualizations at all kinds mm -hmm. of meetings, events. She's the leader of the Doodle Revolution and a growing effort to debunk the myths that doodling is a distraction. <coughs> Using common sense, experience, and neuroscience, Sunny is proving that a doodle is <laughs> that to doodle is to ignite your whole mind. That's right. Her consultancy, Bright Spot ID, specializes in visual thinking and its broad application of partners with the best of the best in the field. Sunny Thanks. presents regularly on the topics of graphics facilitation and graphic recording and is also super funny. So I think you guys will enjoy today's yeah. presentation. And that was 20 minutes, so let's go. <laughs> My presentation is done now. <laughs> Thank you. So I have to point out, which I'm sure you've all noticed, that this clearly says TEDx UT. And as you know, this is not a TEDx event. And yeah, I know. <laughs> You're like at the wrong meeting, dude. Um, and then it says April 2nd, and so I want to explain that immediately because I was horrified at the thought that I would have a title slide at like one of the premier design firms in the country uh, that had an inaccurate date and an inaccurate event. But it's, uh, it's Carrie's fault, and um, <laughs> I, would like to, I would like to make that explicitly clear because right before I got here, I was on vacation. I was totally vacating, do you know? And she emailed me and she was like, me and Nancy cooked up this thing, like maybe you could come and give a, don't you have some presentation just kind of prepared, you know? And I was like, I was like, no, I customize my presentations. So that's why the title slide is totally inaccurate, but I want you to know the content is good and you'll like it, so. Um, and you may even educate me on some of it since you're all probably, uh, uh, presumably visual thinkers. But so yes, I am the self-proclaimed leader of the Doodle Revolution. And you should all self-proclaim yourself something because it's totally worthwhile, like Jedi or Ninja. Um, and so, and what it is, as she described it, is it, it, it is an effort to debunk the idea that doodling is not appropriate because um, in classrooms and in business settings, obviously not this one, but in almost every business setting that you go to, it's, it's wildly inappropriate to sketch and to doodle and to draw. Um, and that's a, really a travesty because we know, and I'll, I'll talk about some of this over the course of the presentation, that doodlers are really powerful people, period. So, with that said, <laughs> I wanted to tell you, uh, this, this presentation is really about how people learn. So I got interested in how people learn when I entered the world of visual thinking because originally I was very left brain and very analytical, which I don't know if you, I mean, I guess you would all call yourselves creatives. Is that accurate? Is there anybody? Not you. So there's one. Okay. <laughs> Not you, very good. Yeah, so I didn't actually identify as a creative until I uh, became more of an adult because that was bled out of me over the course of my schooling. Um, and so, so thankfully I entered into this world called visual thinking that is an emergent field and it incorporates things like industrial design and graphic design and storyboarding and group facilitation and all that good stuff. And the specific entry point for me was called graphic recording. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. There's quite a few graphic recorders in the Bay Area specifically because it really got started uh, in Silicon Valley and kind of branched out from there. But um, it was a transformative experience for me to, to enter into it in that way. Um, and I also refer to graphic recording for people who are strangers to the language as visual note taking, right? Because then that kind of brings it into people like, oh, I know what that is. So you all know what note taking is because you have to do it to get through school. But most people don't know that visual note taking is essentially the distillation of some kind of auditory or text based content into a visual language format. Um, and the active interpretive agent of that information is the brain, right? And of course, the hands. So as a large-scale graphic recorder, this is one of the ways that I take visual notes. Um, this is South by Southwest, and I do that every year. And I'm always trying to get Nancy to come, because she's a natural for South by Interactive. But I do this work in service to groups. So if I was trying to extract information or data from somebody in a live session, I would be, you know, I would turn around, ask them some questions, draw some more content, and keep moving until everything was explicit and visually uh, clear, and everybody had consensus around it. And that's why graphic recorders and facilitators are so useful. 
I'm not saying I'm incredibly useful, but I kind of am. Um, so I wanted to show you examples of other visual notes. Uh, this is my friend Austin Cleon. He's super awesome. He lives in Austin, and um, he's a little rising star. But he just, he just sits around and watches like Nova and does visual note taking. Uh, these are notes from one of my clients, and I included these specifically because of the fact that they really showcase the basic shapes that are involved in taking visual notes, because most of the time, and again, y'all are a different audience because you're obviously specialized you know, visual thinkers, but I'm delivering this at TEDx at a university setting where they're all left brain linear types, so forgive me if I say some things that you're like, duh. So <laughs> that's probably going to happen a couple times. But these showcase the fundamental things that are, are actually quite simplistic. If you break them down, they're very simple. So anyone can take visual notes, and anyone uh, could ultimately be a graphic recorder if they were so inclined, is my theory. This is a mind map. I'm sure you're all familiar with mind maps, also a very effective way to take visual notes. And finally, these are just some black and white notes that I took at Dan Rome's back of the napkin workshop. I don't know if you guys know Dan Rome. He's also awesome, and he's making visual thinking accessible to business people. Because I think uh, from, the, from the conversations I've just had, apparently you have to deal with people who are like, what's the, I don't get it. What's the value? And so there's a whole group of business people that are making that um, accessible and clear to people who don't associate with it naturally. So in my uh, experiences as a visual thinker and a graphic recorder, I had a bunch of whoa moments, right? Because like I said, I was um, very much a wordy girl. I was a linguist and a journalist. Um, and considered myself, like all the other people, like very left brainy, you know? But I noticed after I was doing these murals that I had a really high level of comprehension of content. A lot of times it was dreadfully boring, like, you know, financial management software or accounting or something just, you know, where I was like, oh my God, kill me. But at the end of the session, I had a good big picture grasp of it. And that surprised me because I didn't expect that to be the case. I also noticed that weeks and months later, after immersing myself into this content and visualizing it, um, I had really impressive recall. And so I didn't have to like, re-remember um, that content. I could see it again and immediately come back to it, which also surprised me. Um, I had increased creativity. Clearly, it's not a problem for any of you. But for a lot of business people, creativity is elusive. And they think of it as like a black box. And so um, I, I, had, I noticed uh, that I was able to make associations and problem solve in ways that surprised a lot of the people that I was working with in groups. And finally, um, I had ninja-like listening skills. Because I noticed that when you're drawing and you're not trying to scribble to capture all the content that somebody's saying, it forces you to hone in on what is their message, what matters, what's important here. So um, by the time I was done, I was like, I was basically a genius. <laughs> that was my theory, right, for like a day. I was like, oh my god. I was like, my frontal lobes have grown in, because they keep growing until you're in your 30s. So I was like, my frontal lobes have fully grown in, and my mom told me I was going to be a genius, so clearly I'm becoming one. And I was so <laughs> thrilled. And then I entertained that hypothesis for a day or so. And then I finally figured out it was the process of tracking auditory content and text-based content um, in, and transforming it into a visual language that was, in fact, genius in the sense that it allowed me to use parts of my brain that I was not uh, engaging otherwise. Uh -uh. Ding. I forgot about that. I haven't presented this since April, OK, <laughs> like as I mentioned earlier. So I want to just tell a story. So. Um, the Austin American Statesman was featuring people who were doing creative and interesting work. And so they were looking for people to submit their names uh, of other people. And I just submitted my own name. <laughs> like, like, no shame at all. Just like, I'm doing awesome work. And they were like, OK. So I ended up in the paper. And then this, la this lady saw the article. And um, this, is not, this, is like, this is just the auditory part. I'm not going to switch visuals for a little bit. But, um, and her name was Virginia Schofield. And she told me a very interesting story. Because there's not a ton of empirical evidence to support visual note taking as a learning technique. But she um, is a genius. And she's a brilliant human being. And she got her PhD in immunology in 1977 uh, from UT. And then she went on to the Stanford School of Medicine and did her postdoc there. And she was telling me this situation where she had her aha moment about visualization. And it was, um, oh yeah, the thing she, <laughs> it's always like, why are there sperm? So the thing that she's, <laughs> <laughs> the thing that she's most famous for is that um, you know professors can be famous for having breakthrough research, and she's actually a celebrated professor because she was the first one to articulate that HIV and AIDS were spread through sperm. Because prior to that, they didn't know the molecular mechanism by which the virus spread, and she discovered that by working with sea squirts. And she was like, "I work with sea squirts," and I was like, "What the hell is a sea squirt?" <laughs> and so I had to just draw a picture of one, just because I bet you didn't know what a sea squirt was, did you? 
No. <laughs> now you do. Anyway, and so she was telling me how she came to this um, realization of how to learn. And she was uh, not yet Dr. Schofield, and she was, uh, the only dream in her life ever was to be at Dr. Schofield, so she didn't have a plan B. And she was trying to get uh, to graduate school, and she needed a stratospheric score on her GRE for obvious reasons, but she also had to have straight A's. And she had failed organic chemistry once before. So organic, and, and she's an incredibly intelligent lady, but she could not get through organic chemistry. And so she was terrified to take it again, for obvious reasons. And um, this was the book. The whole time she was explaining the story to me, because she comes to my house all like, you know, professorial, like quirky, super weird lady. <laughs> and she is like, I was studying for Morrison and Boyd. Like everybody knows what that is. And so I looked it up and I found out that like every student who is a student of chemistry or immunology is terrified of this book. Like it's like it's like the satanic verses for students or something. <laughs> and so so she was under a lot of pressure and she she didn't want to fail and she didn't want to she didn't have another career path. Um, so she did what every student does when they're trying to learn something and what every learner does is which they take something in a book and then they make notes, right? And then they read a page in the book and then they make notes again. <laughs> and so they just go through this really heinous process of trying to understand really complicated information and nothing ever happens for a lot of learners. Um, and finally it occurred to her to start drawing pictures of, of the content. And she just, she was, you know, it was over Christmas holidays, people have finals after the holidays, and it just came to her. So she literally took this huge book, I saw it in person, it is intimidating, and she took every chapter and she articulated what it was saying in a visual language format, and she kept redacting it and figuring it out until it was firmly cemented and etched into her mind. Um, and so needless to say, she got like a 99 on it, she went on to become Dr. Schofield, and she uh, got over her anxiety about organic chemistry. Um, but she didn't forget that lesson, and so when she became Dr. Schofield in you know, academia, she, over the four, four decades that she taught, all of her students were visual note takers. And so um, it was really interesting because she's the first professor I've met that actually instituted it into her classroom as a setting you know, over a long period of time. And she um, had incredibly high success rates with all of her students. So it's not like there's some students who are visual and other students that aren't. All students and all learners are visual in some way. And so she had an incredibly high success rate in, um, in academic institutions and continued to, um, to uh, sort of prove that visuals are incredibly powerful. So what do we know about visuals in the brain? Visuals, uh, we, we have a plethora of evidence to support that human beings are visual. I mean, it's pretty intuitive, you know, we're all staring at each other right now, you know, or you're all staring at me. Can you stare at each other for a second? Oh, it's exhausting. Um, but we know quite a bit, and so, uh, and actually, w when I'm working with clients, I like to explain to them why visuals are incredibly powerful, because they don't always understand it. Like, they get it sort of, you know, but instinctively, but they don't know how much science there is behind it. So if this grid were to represent your cerebral cortex, so your cerebral cortex, I love you, you're like totally agreeing with everything I say. I'm like, <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, uh, so your cerebral cortex is the outermost part of your mammalian brain, okay, and it's what separates us from animals, uh, you know, some of us. And, um, <laughs> and so if this grid were representative of the sensory neurons in your cerebral cortex that are responsible for processing incoming information, right? So you're a human being, you're walking around the planet, you're taking in information. We actually have nine senses, but there's only five that we talk about. Um, this is how it would be represented. So 75% of the neurons in your cerebral cortex are dedicated to processing visual information, which means that we are like visual information processing robots, you know, like that is our job. Um, and the rest are roughly evenly distributed amongst the other senses. Um, something else that we know about the brain is this phenomenon called the picture superiority effect, which simply stated it means that the more visual the input is, the more likely we are to retain and recall it. Um, and scientists love to do these comparative studies about what's the retention and recall of text-based versus auditory versus visual information, and it always, you know, pictures absolutely demolish it, it's no, it's no contest. So this is where somebody gets to win a book. Um, how, after this, after this presentation, you hear me talking, how, uh, what percentage of the information that I'm saying do you think you're gonna remember 72 hours after this event? Just guess. Scary cats. Well, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Three, ten. Oh, boo! 
You already have a book. Yeah, she, uh, that's okay. We will, because I have another one. Because that's cool, because nobody, um, nobody, I didn't think anybody said 10. I was listening, but. Okay, so yeah, so 72 hours after you leave this room, you're going to remember 10% of what I say. So basically nothing. So it's like I'm not even talking. You know? <laughs> um, I'm sorry, excuse me? Um, and then after, okay, so now we have another chance to win a book. Because Nancy already has a book. Yeah, you can't guess. Okay, so, and, and I'll give you all a hint. It's a rounded number. There's no, like, 17. It's all rounded off. So there's no, <laughs> there's no fractions. There's no imaginary numbers. Um, but so, yeah, so guess what? It, it's going to be a year later, not 72 hours later, but one year later. What's the retention rate of visuals going to be? Just 40? 75. 80. Who said 90? <laughs> He's like, yeah, so 90%. So this is significantly different. This is not like they're kind of close, and one of them's like a welterweight, and the other one's a middleweight. I mean, this is ridiculous, you know? And um, people in the external world don't understand how to leverage that as well as they should. So I'll, I'll give you the book. Maybe somebody else. There's more. Mm. <laughs> All right, so the final thing that uh, you know, I want to kind of be nerdy about is this thing called the dual coding theory. So this one is, I think, the most sort of complicated to articulate, so kind of just stay with me. You have two channels in your brain that process information. One of them, I call them highways. One of them is a verbal highway, and the other is a visual highway. And on the verbal highway, that includes auditory content and text-based content. And on the visual highway, it's anything pictorial. So if you're in a learning environment, like a classroom or like a staff meeting, and these, are, these cars are representative information that's auditory information that you're hearing when you're in a meeting. And these cars are representative of text-based information that often happens when people are trying to capture content or they're trying to write. Or, for example, they're trying to read a PowerPoint while someone's talking. So this is a traffic jam. So the reason, if you're in a learning situation and you're asking people to pay attention to both of those things simultaneously, you're, you're basically asking their brain to go haywire on some level. Of course, we can get a general idea of what's going on, but it's not the most effective way to learn. And then meanwhile, we have the visual information superhighway, which is like that cerebral cortex I told you about, which is like a portal, you know, and there's like nothing happening, you know, in most situations. There's maybe a bicycle or something. <laughs> and so we know that the ideal combination, and you all know, working here particularly, that the ideal combination for people to actually absorb information is to have to let those two work in concert and, of course, to have an emotional impact coupled with those things. Um, but despite the fact that this is all scientifically based, people know this intuitively on some level, we still see people uh, taking notes like this or increasingly on their laptops like this. And um, I need to figure out what my next slide is. I can't remember. But uh, OK, close your eyes. I need, to, I need to move my. OK, got it. OK, thank you. So uh, tell me, can anybody just start, just kind of bubble out, like, what's wrong with these notes? It, like, why are these notes going to hell? They're bullets. Bullets? I think bullets are evil, so. <laughs> <laughs> Not a big fan of bullet points? Yeah. What's in a, what, are they, what are they missing? What could they use? It's too much detail. No hierarchy. Uh-huh. It's just visual noise. Uh-huh. All of those things. They have no pattern. They have no visuals. There's no color. They're totally monotone. Boring. There's no, it's exactly, they're not visually stimulating. There's no association from content to the next content. You can't tell what's important, so they obscure keywords. So they waste time. So when students are going back over notes or people are learning and going back over their notes, there's nothing that stands out where they're like, this is relevant. So process. you have to read through it to get that it's a step process. So you can easily just visually just, OK, step one is this, step two is this. And you can see that it flows. Exactly. So going through all this and going, oh, there's a meaning, middle, and end. Right. Okay. Absolutely. They don't, the meaningfulness of this information is not embedded in these, in these notes. But we know that's true, um, and yet we still see 95% of students in academic institutions and in you know, uh, schools like elementary schools, even in junior high, taking notes like this. And if we wanted to design a system of note taking that was actually, its purpose was to shut your brain down, it would be those. So it's kind of crazy talk. Um, and Tony Buzan, who is the inventor of mind maps, he has done these global studies of people around the world and learners around the world, and he asked them to, dis to associate words with note taking, at, you know, and then he like, compiled all the data. And the most common words were, you know, a headache, a wasted time, 
boring, painful, you know, agonizing, and my favorite one was punishment. So basically, like, if you take notes, it's like you're a criminal and someone hates you, and they want you, you know what I mean? And, but yet we still see people doing it for, you know, indefinitely and forever. And so if there were a continuum representing the fact that we know how our brain is wired, we know how to teach people the basics of visual language, we know that it's accessible to anyone, the visual alphabet is not, it's in the in game storming, the visual alphabet is something that anyone can do. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and call it ludicrous that we don't leverage the system that we have in our brains. And I would like to ask for another word for ludicrous. What's another word for ludicrous? Man, you guys are shy. Aren't y'all creatives? I don't. Is it like the end of the day and you're like, I'm happy hour? And, you know? I'm just thinking hip hop artists. I know. <laughs> Ludicrous. I know. Well, that's just a good segue because I was going to say redonkulous. Perfect. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's bananas. And so I, do, I, I go around and I explain this to people on a regular basis because it, cause it's sort of a mission of mine and it is a revolution. And um, I don't think that it's appropriate that we're not understanding how we learn and how we think. Uh, so, <laughs> not that I get a TED wish, because I'm not a TED, but if I had a TED wish, it would be that we would take the, uh, the idea of visual language and visual thinking out of the exclusive realms of artists and designers, because currently, you know, it's associated only with certain types of people, and that we would sort of kind of put it in the hands of my foot soldiers, which are normal people, and people who do not associate themselves with creativity necessarily, but could certainly be served by understanding visual language and leveraging it. So that's why I'm starting a doodle revolution. And that's all for today. Thank you. Open it up to questions. Do you guys have any questions for Sunny? They, apparently not. They don't even talk. <laughs> that's that's serious. A better time than 8.30 in the morning. You can be more awake for the staff meeting. Yeah. That's yeah. their long way. Yeah. So I was just curious, like, when did you start this whole doodle revolution? That's a great question. So when I was, I was going out in the world and I was doing these big murals and, you know, of course there were some people who would be like, this is amazing and they got it, you know, they totally got it. They'd be like, I'm a visual learner, this is, articulates everything they said, like, and then there'd be other people who'd be like, scoff, you know, they'd be like, oh, that's really fun and, you know, that's so cute. And you're like, I will kill you. And so after a while, and, and so I noticed this repeatedly, like in really in places where it actually needed to be appreciated more. So I started noticing too, like, like I collected all these anecdotes, right? Because I declared myself the leader of the revolution, and then people think you are. And then they start telling you their stories. And then I started realizing that it really is a phenomenon, particularly in Western society, where it's not okay to draw in places where you're supposed to be learning something. Like you get, you know, you get chastised by all your teachers and your professors. And that's when I started realizing like this is bigger than I thought and I need to make it publicly uh, known and I need to do some research about what visuals do for the brain. So that's, that's why I started. I'm just rebellious by nature so I just wanted to revolt against something. <laughs> so I found that. Yeah, thanks for asking. Oh, sure. Uh, so game storming is, um, it's actually really cool. I don't know, like I, I showed you guys the mural, I'm like, <laughs> uh, but I showed you guys the, um, the mural, right? So game storming is, because creatives, like a lot of times creative people don't know how they are creative. They just create, like they know like, oh, you know, I take a nap or I have a dream or I go to drink some alcohol or whatever. And they understand, they, they, they like come up with stuff, but people don't have insight into how they actually create. And so game storming, what we did is we kind of scanned some of the best practices for creative types to get to any kind of problem solving. Sometimes it could be like building a team. Other times it could be coming up with a slogan for a product. And we just took, um, there's 83 games, we took some of the best techniques that creative people don't know that they use, but that they do use, and then put them in an accessible format for people who need help being creative. <laughs> so that's kind of the premise of game storming. Yeah. Is this fascinating or what? Yeah. <laughs> so do you find uh, books and other learning formats pretty boring now that you're at a hyperspeed leadership <laughs> flagship doodle revolutionizer? Well, that's such a good question because I'm a total reader. Like I've been an avid reader my whole life, but uh, I can't, I can no longer read something without thinking, God, if they just had a visual explaining this, like I always think that. And once you start thinking like that, almost anything needs a visual, even, you know, epics like Ulysses. You know what I mean? It's like, give this thing a graphic novel and let's just do this, you know? But yeah, no, I have a lot of respect for the word, for sure, because um, I think they should work in concert, so. 
Yeah, but that's a good question. Do you ever find that hard to like sell? Like, have you had a really bad client where you're like, I don't get this like total deal from the machine table? Oh, yeah. So how do you convince them otherwise? Oh, I just tell them to shut the hell up. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. See, and like, that's the thing is, um, I've, I, I've learned that in order to understand why people, because I think a lot of it's fear of the unknown. And so what I try to do is understand what is it that they don't really understand about it and how can I explain, uh, sort of solve that question uh, in a way that makes sense to them. So like if they're an academic, right, then I'm going to say, you know what, there's academic research that supports that doodling does this, right? And if they're a salesperson, I'm going to be like, did you know that you can sell, like upsell 20% by having a visual? So it's really just about understanding what they need to know and the angle by which they can understand and then articulating that to them. So it's hard because, you know, there's like hundreds of different types of people in the world. So like I can't respond to like every single one of them, but I get the big buckets and then I, and then I educate myself on what they need to know. Can you kind of find a way to relate to them? And yes. And it helps. And it, I mean, it's not like 100% solution, but it certainly helps and they appreciate me trying. And some people really just are never going to go there. But it's not very many. Once you speak their language, it's not very many that won't. They won't get it. So how do, you, how do you handle the big murals when part of it's wrong? It's never wrong. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they said. Yeah. No, uh, so I have whiteout, for sure. I actually don't use it very often. And most importantly, this is what I always tell people, because some people are perfectionists, and I'm a little bit like that, but I'm working on it. Um, that it doesn't matter, right? So perfection in this situation is not important because what's important, accuracy is like, I can't write down something that somebody did not say, for sure. But if I misspell a word, you know, like forgive myself, keep going. It's, a lot of it is improvisational. So you have to, because it's in the moment, you have to just keep going. And, and you, again, educate the client. So, because they think that too. They're like, she thinks it's supposed to be perfect. So if I model to them that it's not supposed to be perfect, then they're like, oh, cool. It's like more messy than we thought. And then they get into it. So it's a little bit of, um, of education and like forgiving yourself and keeping going, which was hard in the beginning. I was like, I'm going to kill myself. You know, like, it was horrible. I get like tunnel vision and want to pass out. You know, <laughs> it was so difficult. But yeah, once you understand that the process is just really about uh, helping people understand something, then you don't feel like it has to be flawless. I know, it's so random, right? Because I was working at the State Bar of California doing ethics exams. <laughs> like, people who were murderers were applying to be attorneys. I was like, I think you failed, you know? <laughs> I'm just, maybe it's just me, but I thought you failed. But uh, so I was just living in San Francisco, and I really, truly stumbled upon a company that used large-scale visual thinking as a, as a methodology. And it was almost by the grace of God, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I'm always very open, and I'm always searching, and I'm always looking for things that feel like they resonate with who I am. So I did, it wasn't completely random, but it felt that way. And so when I started, um, it was like being home. I was like, oh my god, it's, they're, li they're linguistic people, but they're visual people. And so I just kept pursuing it because it, it meant a lot to me. Um, and I would straight up volunteer. You know, I, like I would say, somebody would say, oh, we're going to have a, you know, a, a session at my house where we're going to brainstorm our next vacation. And I'd be like, I'll bring my flip chart. You know, and I would start drawing, and then I, got, you know, started getting paid for it, and that was nicer. But yeah, I just practiced, practiced quite a bit because it's so useful. You can apply it in any situation. You know, in any problem-solving situation, you, it's applicable. I teach people. If any of you want to learn, go ahead. So what do you think of people? Because a lot of people will categorize themselves like I'm an auditory learner, yeah. I'm a visual learner. What, what's your response to something like that? That is such a good question. So. Um, there's three main pathways that we learn, auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. Um, there's some olfactory learners, but they're like so rare, they're like aliens, so it's hard to, you know what I mean? Um, and, and the deal is that no, nobody is only one type of learner. Everybody is, has a default learning style, and then they have a secondary that's like tightly connected. So for me, it's kinesthetic and visual, and auditory is my, my most difficult area. And, and I actually got better at it when I started having to listen. So you can, you can actually exercise those pathways and get better at them. So the reason why the doodle is super awesome is because it engages all three of those pathways simultaneously. Because when you're doodling, you're moving and you're being kinesthetic and you're also being visual. And most of the time when I'm doodling, I'm listening to something. So it is like imprinting on three levels. And that's why it's so, so hugely powerful. So uh, if people are like, I'm an auditory learner, I don't get it. I'm like, well, draw and talk to yourself while you're drawing. 
because then you're engaging your, your primary channel, but you're also adding another layer of meaning to it. Are you an auditory learner? Um, I'm a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. Auditory and visual? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would bet in this crowd that there's a lot of that. We could do tests. They have online tests. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I you guys yeah, thanks for your time. Of course. Thank you. Clap for myself, it's awesome. <laughs>